Today, we are going to wrap up our summer sermon series entitled Focus, which has been an opportunity for us to take a closer look at the concept of faith, which we've described as um, choosing to believe what we can't see because of what we can see. And while it's true that we cannot physically see Jesus, we have many eyewitness accounts from people who did. And often, these eye-opening encounters transform the way that people saw themselves, others, the world, and their purpose in it. And so by taking a closer look at these first-hand accounts, we know some critical things about Jesus that as his followers, we are now called to show to others. And because we know and have experienced his resurrection rescue and the unrelenting hope that it offers us, we are now called to show and share the same unrelenting hope with the world around us. And really, what better time than this to offer unrelenting hope? And during this time of pervasive isolation and so many lonely cries, this is getting old. Then during this time of difficult decision making for administrations wrestling with school openings and start dates, the safety of students and teachers, the challenges of transportation, socially distanced classrooms, and remote learning, and so many frustrated cries, this is getting old. And during this time of instability for businesses who grapple with decisions about whether to open, close, or adapt to new ways of doing things, with disruptions to work hours, wages, weekly paychecks, and health benefits for countless employees, and all the anxious cries, this is getting old. Then during this time of virtual worship, when we miss the ability of our church community to gather here in this sanctuary side by side, and all the longing cries, this is getting old. And then during this time, when people of color feel the overbearing weight of centuries of racial inequality and injustice, too tired and exhausted to even utter this is getting old because it is already past ancient. Even during these difficult times, no, especially during these difficult times, unrelenting hope is still our story. We have unrelenting hope thanks to Christ's resurrection rescue on that first Easter morn. When Jesus rises up and walks out of that grave, he delivers us from the grip of sin and the grasp of death offering us the gift of new life. And we too are called to rise up in ways that mirror the story of this deliverance and freedom and new life to others. So today's scripture comes from the final chapters of the final book of the Christian canon, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5a. These words come from a man named John, who is not John, son of Zebedee, one of the original 12, nor is it the evangelist who wrote the Gospel of John, nor the writer of the epistles. This John is a pastor, a poet, a prophet, exiled to the island of Patmos, some 60 miles southwest of what we know today as Turkey. It's late in the first century, Roman rule dominates the region, and John receives this series of visions from an angel, which he then describes in writing to seven churches on the mainland, all of whom were suffering persecution by the Roman government too. Now the book of Revelation is a type of literature called Apocalypse which often gets equated and a little misleading, um, known as end times. But in reality, in Greek, revelation is more about the sense of unveiling. And apocalypses are usually addressed to those living in times of suffering and persecution, as is the case here. In essence, John is the seer who was shown this series of visions. 55 times, he says, he saw. 
and to describe to the churches the things that he has seen unveiled. He uses a variety of images, symbols, metaphor, and allusions in hopes of conveying the importance of faithful worship and faithful relationship with God. And then ultimately, this vision culminates in a holy time, place, and space face-to-face with God and the Lamb. And it's interesting to note that instead of us ascending into heaven, as we often imagine, John describes bringing heaven down to earth. And this heaven on earth, time, place, and space, in which evil, suffering, sadness, and pain are eradicated forever. The glory and goodness of God's abiding presence and abundant love triumph. Which brings us to our bottom line for today. That showing Jesus means telling a story that ends in hope. So let's take a look at the text together. But before we do, will you please pray with me? Startle us, O God, startle us anew with your truth, and by the power of your living spirit, open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to these words, your holy word, that we might draw closer to Christ, empowered to go forth as his faithful disciples in the world. Amen. So listen now for God's word to you from Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's peoples. And God, God's self, will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glenn and I may not have picked the best day to get married. In the height of springtime, when we chose it, the last Saturday of September 2005 seemed as good a day as any to walk down the aisle and say our I do's. But what we didn't know at the time of our decision was that the country was in store for the most active hurricane season in recorded history. All said and done, 31 tropical and subtropical subtropical storms developed with the National Hurricane Center naming 27 of them, which exhausted the pre-designated list of alphabetical names in the process and we had to eke into six of them being named with Greek letters. 15 of those 31 developed into hurricanes, seven of which became major hurricanes, Cat 3 or higher, and four of those seven reached Cat 5 status, the highest rank on the scale, with winds whipping in at 157 miles per hour or higher. The season kicked off with Emily in July, the most intense and early Cat 5 in recorded history. Then Katrina followed in August, wreaking havoc and devastating New Orleans and the Gulf Coast with over 1,800 deaths and $125 billion worth of damage. And then following way too closely on Katrina's heels, another Cat 5 named Rita showed up on the scene in September with the eye at one point predicted to hit Austin, Texas on September 24th, the day of our nuptials. With the Texas coast in evacuation mode and millions fleeing the approaching storm by driving northward, the freeways were gridlocked. Flights, too, were disrupted and canceled all over the country, forcing many of our guests to have to cancel their travel plans at the last minute, too. Our phones were ringing off the hook as various friends and family tried to figure out what to do. 
With torrential rains expected, we hurried to Academy to snap up a supply of giant golf umbrellas. And at one point, our pastor even asked us if we'd like her to marry us during the rehearsal, just in case the storm inhibited our ability to gather for our planned ceremony the next day. So needless to say, it was a chaotic time. But on the morning of the big day, as my mom and sister and Gigi and closest girlfriends circled around me and we got ready, all I was focused on was this incredible sense of joy, excitement, and anticipation about starting this new life with Glenn and creating a home and a future with him. Which is one of the images that John paints for us in Revelation 21. How this holy city, this new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven, presenting itself as a bride for her husband. A wedding is about to take place, which means a new beginning is at hand. It is the beginning of a new eternal identity, the beginning of a new eternal family, the beginning of building a new eternal home and the new life that goes along with it. And emanating forth from all of this possibility and newness at hand is hope. John says that this is the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth, replacing the former heaven and earth, which are now gone. And also gone is the sea. You know what a world without a sea is? It's a world without chaos and evil and danger and destruction. Because in ancient writings, the sea was considered home to sea monsters like Leviathan. So it's constantly used in scripture writings to depict chaos and evil or in essence, the things that separate us from each other and from God. And in the case of John being exiled on the island of Patmos, the sea separated him from the churches on the mainland that he's writing to. So if we keep in mind that at the time that John's writing this letter, the Romans had already destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple like some 20 years earlier. Persecution was still pervasive throughout Asia Minor too, where they are. It is easy to imagine the magnitude of despair at their hand and understand why these churches so desperately needed a word of hope. This is getting old. According to theologian Justo Gonzalez, the vision of a city without a sea announces a new creation without separations, without isolations, without exiles. It is a unifying vision, one that compels us to consider the metaphorical seas that separate us from God and others today. We often find the chaotic waters of issues surrounding race, politics, and economics difficult to confront, preferring instead to ignore them by floating in the calmer waters of like-minded circles. But John's vision rejects this response and calls us instead to build bridges and heal the chasm. This vision in Revelation is a climactic moment. Similar to that surprise of an empty tomb and a risen Lord on Easter, our sovereign creator is surprising us again, this time taking what is old and tarnished and broken and transforming it into something new and beautiful and whole. God does not destroy, but instead, God redeems. And God goes one step further. God also dwells with us eternally. Dwells. The Greek word used here means tent, so pitch a tent. And it's seen in one other place in John 1.14, when the word became flesh and lived, pitched a tent among us for some 33 years in human form. And what God did in Jesus, God is now doing on a cosmic scale. This is the glory of God, no longer transient as a traveling pillar of fire or luminous cloud. This is us permanently aware of and in the presence of God's glory. We have in our hands another God with us promise. 
And it is here in this new and transformed place where God will dwell, will live with, will tent, will tabernacle, will abide with mortals, which means that we're invited into this vision too. So yes, showing Jesus means telling a story that ends in hope. However, showing Jesus also means telling a story that speaks hope now. And considering how pervasive feelings of hopelessness are today, this is a story that needs to be shared urgently. According to psychology professors Anthony Scioli and Henry Biller in their book, Hope in an Age of Anxiety, when one or more of our four basic needs, which is hope, attachment, mastery, and survival are disrupted, one of these nine forms of hopelessness may be experienced. Look at the list, alienation, forsakenness, or abandonment, um, uninspired, where we feel no purpose in life or opportunity for growth, powerlessness, oppression, limitedness, doom, captivity, whether it's physical or emotional, and helplessness. So how can we speak, show Jesus and speak hope into these situations? Well, in his book, Surprised by Hope, N.T. Wright makes the case that the mission of the church today must reflect and be shaped by the future hope as the New Testament presents it. And Wright also urges us to ground ourselves in the message of hope and new life that comes with the good news of the resurrection. I highly commend this book to you if you haven't read it. So believing in God's promise to heal and redeem creation in its entirety and believing that we have a responsibility to embrace these redemption efforts now, Wright suggests we should focus our attention and efforts in three particular areas, justice, beauty, and evangelism. This he proposes as the foundation for the work of hope in the day-to-day -day life of the church. So I'd like to take just a quick look at each. First, justice, defined here as the intention of God. Seeking justice takes seriously the words of Jesus when he taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, how would be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. When this isn't the case and a sense of injustice hangs over a community, it's quite common for feelings of hopelessness to set in, which is why one of our purposes as the church as the body of Christ in the world, is to confront this sense of injustice by exposing it, bringing it to light, standing in solidarity with victims as they speak up and speak out about it, and lifting it to God in prayer. It is our task as followers of Jesus to hold hands with our neighbors in Austin and beyond and enrich lives by advocating for nutrition, housing, health care, and education in ways that implement a sense of security and invoke systemic change. We partner with schools, nonprofits, and government entities in a number of different ways, all with the intention of fostering hope at every level. Every time we mentor a child, feed a homeless neighbor, fill a backpack, register a voter, set up a home for a refugee or an asylum seeker and accompany them as they acclimate to Austin, another child of God is empowered through our actions. Part of the argument that Wright makes in his book is that when this is done and steps like these are taken, it offers more than hope for life after death. It offers the hope for life before death, on earth as it is in heaven. Second, beauty. When people are struggling with hopelessness, especially in poor communities around the word, ugliness exacerbates the issue. It's understandable, really, that when people cease to be surrounded by beauty, they also cease to hope. Think about a world without beauty and the message that it sends. It says, you lack value, that you're not worthy, that you're less than. But being surrounded by beauty, on the other hand, speaks to our souls, perhaps because it reminds us just the opposite, that we are loved, that we are valued, that we are worthy, that we are beautiful ourselves as image bearers of the Almighty One who created and authored it all. With this in mind, consider what could happen if we embraced our role as God's collaborators in creation and new creation. 
What would it look like if we focused on highlighting the glory of creation all around us, the beauty of nature and music and art and writing in ways that bring beauty to the eyes of all who behold it? Our recent virtual choirs come to mind here. Despite being isolated and separated from each other, a number of singers and musicians share their talents on a single recording done alone from home usually, which is then sent to Beth, our, what do you call yourself? General dictator. General dictator uh, who combines and layers these recordings into a collective, collaborative piece of music that elicits our praise, and often our tears as well, and sometimes our laughter, like today for the beauty that it beholds. Despite being physically separated from each other, voices joined together in song, the community persists, and that in and of itself is beautiful and hope-filled, and who knows who else will be affected by this beauty and hope when they watch it on YouTube. And then the third is evangelism. Engaging in the work of new creation means purposefully bringing about glimpses of God's glory, these acts of justice and beauty that point to this redeemed creation that God intends for us. And we do this by showing and sharing this story of unrelenting hope. Now, if you're like me, the word evangelism conjures up some negative images sometimes. But for us, what we're talking about here is all the ways there are of announcing the good news. That God loves us, that Christ saves us, and that the Holy Spirit empowers and accompanies us. I'm currently reading Marianne McKibben Dana's book, God, Improv, and the Art of Living. And in it, she shares a story that I think illustrates um, these ideas of justice and beauty and evangelism um, kind of dovetailing and playing out in a creative ways in our daily life. She writes this. Many years ago, I worked with a church in Houston's Third Ward, which is an economically depressed area in town. The neighborhood embodied a paradox which is common in some urban neighborhoods, of dignity mingled with despair. Although the people I met were proud of their neighborhood's history and culture and worked to make it better, without significant opportunities for economic advancement, it was an uphill climb. The local Episcopal church stood next to a liquor superstore, an example of contradictions in the neighborhood. The door to the church office overlooked the side of the store, which was a bare wall that proved tempting for the young people in the area who frequently tagged it with graffiti. Both the business and the church fretted over the defacement and they had gotten into an arms race with the gangs, so the wall was painted over numerous times. But the graffiti would return, the artists apparently grateful for a blank canvas and on it went, world without end. Finally, the church decided to work with a local artist to decide um, to design a mural for the wall. The store owners, out of idea, went along with it, and so the artist's task was to make sure that the resulting design incorporated the spray-painted tags, not highlighting them, but not hiding them either. Instead, they would be part of the overall image. And then, after planning a design, the artist invited children from the church's day school camp and area to help them with the painting. Now, if you knew what you were looking for, you could see the original graffiti within the crazy quilt of colors and patterns. But according to folks at the church, the wall was a way to say, we see you. We see the despair and the acting out, and we are not going to deny it. It is part of the story of the Third Ward, but we need and would like to move past this conflict." End of quote. So kudos to the church for acknowledging the youth and reaching out to embrace their community in this creative way. Acts such as these are the beginning of bridge building and healing the chasm and hopefully, too, the beginning of new and better relationships. Showing Jesus means telling a story that ends in hope. So where can we share that story today?
by engaging in justice, beauty, and evangelism, we embrace the supportive role we have to play in pointing others to the unrelenting hope and promise of new life that God offers us. As Christ followers, we are called to rise up, to advocate, to accompany, to act, and to live in ways that bring glimpses of redemption into reality on earth as it is in heaven, as much and as often as we can. Beginning right now, may it be so. Alleluia. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Good and gracious God, author of life, you are the one who makes all things new. We rest in the unrelenting hope of this promise, and we also recognize our responsibility to share it. May your Holy Spirit fill us with energy, imagination, passion, and perseverance as we go forth from here to do just that. In Christ's name we pray, amen.